This has been a great week. And I'd just like to say publicly thank you to everybody that had a part in this, all those who worked with these children, those who've done the painting, the backdrops, those who got up the skits and so forth. Uh, I think it's been one of the best Bible schools that we've had in quite a while. I do appreciate that. Tonight we come to the last of the heroes of faith that we're going to be talking about, and that is Noah. Uh, we talk about Noah, say it's the last for this week, but uh, certainly that's not the last of the Bible heroes we have, but we're heroes of faith. There are a number of them that are mentioned uh, throughout the Bible, but in the chapter we've been looking at most tonight, or, or this week, in Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 32, the text says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and of Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And then listen to this, because I think this is so important. In talking about all these men and women of faith, the writer of Hebrews, talking about all that they had suffered because of their faith and trust in God, made this statement about them. He said, of whom the world was not worthy. These individuals we've been talking about and so many others there in the Bible, people of such nature, of such faith, the writer of Hebrews says the world was not worthy of them. When we think about those individuals, they, of course, themselves were not worthy of the salvation they had. Neither are we. We're all saved by the grace of God. But I think it's significant that the Bible says that those in the world, those who have not been responsive to God, to obey God, were not worthy to have such people as this in their midst. And so tonight we're talking about another one of those great individuals of faith. We're talking about this man, Noah. As we begin talking about Noah, I want us to notice, first of all, the world in which Noah was living. The Bible talks about this at least twice here in chapter 6. In verses, verse 2 of chapter 6, it talks about how that the sons of God looked at the daughters of men and saw how beautiful they were and began to marry them. The sons of God evidently were those who were descendants of Seth, and the daughters of men were those who were descendants of Cain. Those who had been more of the righteous were looking to those who were wicked and marrying them. And the reason they were doing so was because they saw that they were beautiful. Just as a sidelight to this, before we get into really talking about Noah, the, the importance of that. Uh, this is why it's so important for young people when they start looking for a spouse that they look for somebody who can help them go to heaven. I know our first attraction may be to that, those who are pretty, those who are beautiful, but beauty is not going to get you to heaven. We need someone that's going to help us go to heaven, someone that has the same kind of faith in God that we have, and we want them to have that faith also. But as you look at this, as soon as the Bible talked about that, how that the sons of God were marrying the daughters of men. The very next verse in verse 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only of evil continually. When those who were followers of God gave in to following or marrying those who were not followers of God, it ended up with the thoughts and intents of their hearts becoming wicked continually. They made their decision. They made their choice in life. And so God makes His choice. God makes His decision. And God says there in Genesis 6 and verse 7, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So God's intention was to wipe out all life on planet earth because of the sins of these people. And God would have done that, except for the fact that the Bible tells us there was this man Noah who found grace in the eyes of God. Most of the translations say that he found favor in the eyes of God, but it's talking about the grace of God. That's the idea being behind it. The King James, the New King James, renders it to grace. I got to looking into the uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. I know nothing of Hebrew. So I looked in that to see what word they used, and they used this word, grace, charis. 
in the Greek language, same word it's translated over and over again in New Testament, grace. You and I are saved by grace. Noah was saved by the grace of God. And because of that, Noah would become the one who would be able to help provide salvation for the human race to keep life here on this earth. So he found grace. He found favor in the eyes of God, and that's of great significance here, to realize that grace that he had. But the question, why was it that Noah found grace in the eyes of God as opposed to all the other people that lived on earth at that time? Noah is the only one that's mentioned as finding grace in the eyes of God. And I think there are at least three things that the Bible tells us there in Genesis 6 about Noah that help us understand why he was the one that found grace in God's eyes. And I think these are significant, and they need to be things that we consider about ourselves that these things might be found in us. Number one, the Bible tells us there, and I believe this is in verse 9 of chapter 6, that Noah was a just man. Other translations render that he was a righteous man. Now, he was not a righteous man intrinsically. That is, he was not righteous in and of himself. Noah was not an individual who had that righteousness, who always did what was right and therefore was declared by God to be righteous. The righteousness he had, he had just as Abraham had it because of the faith that he had. Because of his faith and his trust in God, God counted him as being a righteous individual. The Bible tells us that about uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6 that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And that's what happened here with Noah. Noah was the one that had great faith in God. And so God counted that as righteous. And God says here of Noah that Noah was a righteous man. The other translation that says he was a just man, the idea is he was a justified man. Because again of his faith in God, his trust in God, God counted him as righteous. God justified him in his actions. And that same thing is going to be true for all of us who are children of God today. When we stand before God in judgment, you know, I remember hearing Brother Jimmy Allen talk about that one time in, in judgment, that we'll stand before God, and Satan will be there as our accuser, and he'll make the accusation that Tim Shoemaker is guilty of sin and deserves to be lost eternally in hell. And then Christ Jesus, our defender, our defender on that occasion, and also our judge, will stand up before God and say, Yes, that's right. He's guilty of sin. He is an individual who is guilty, but justified. Not because of my own righteousness, but because of faith and have in Christ. They would be like with Noah, be counted then as a righteous man. But beyond that, the Bible also says here of Noah that Noah was perfect in his generation. Now, when the Bible talks about his being perfection, we need to understand that's a limited perfection. He was not perfect in the sense that he never did anything wrong. We can't say that Noah never committed a single sin. He was guilty of sin, but he was perfect, the Bible says, in his generations. Just think about that generation of people he lived among. The Bible's already told us what they were like. It was where their every thought and intent of their heart was only of evil continually. Now you put Noah in that group, and he stands out like a sore thumb because he is not perfect, but compared to them, he is a righteous man. He is a blameless man. And so it's in that sense that the Bible talks about him being one who is perfect in, all, in his generation. Every intent of the thought hearts of the others was evil, but not so with this man Noah. Noah was a man of great faith in God. And then thirdly, the Bible tells us here that Noah walked with God. That statement's only made of one other person in the Bible, and that's Enoch. Two different times it said of Enoch that he walked with God. And because Enoch walked with God, the Bible says that God took him. Enoch was translated so that he never saw death. God did not take Noah because God had something else in store for Noah, that he would use Noah as the means of keeping life here on this earth. But Noah was an individual that walked with God. And the idea that's used there is that Noah had this purpose in his mind, a fixed purpose that he is going to live his life in keeping with the will of God. He's going to walk with God daily in his life. And that's what he centers his whole life on. The Bible talks about our Lord when he came here for the purpose of dying for us that we might be ransomed from our sins. And when Jesus saw that time coming near and he's going to have to go to Jerusalem, he's going to have to die there, the Bible says he set his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus had a purpose for coming. He had a goal. And he set his face toward Jerusalem to go there and die. Well, basically, that's what Noah has done. 
Noah has a purpose, and he is going to live in keeping with that purpose of service to God. He has set himself fixedly that he's going to walk with God. But in the book of Amos, chapter 3 and verse 3, we read the statement there, can two walk together except they be agreed? It's an impossibility for two people to walk together if they're not in agreement. And there's no way that Noah or anyone else could walk with God if they're not in agreement with God. So when the Bible says and tells us that Noah was an individual who walked with God, we know he was an individual that was in agreement with God. He knew that God was the one to rule. God was the one that would lead. And it was his responsibility to accept what God said and follow him. And so that brings us to this point here of it, that Noah was an individual of great faith. And that faith is demonstrated over and over again. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 7, and this is where we'll spend most of our time for the remaining time we have. In Hebrews 11 and verse 7, the text says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. That one little verse that talks about Noah begins with faith and it ends with faith. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house. When we talk about faith, we are talking primarily about this idea of trust. He was an individual that trusted God. One's faith, the Bible shows us, may be alive and active, James 2 and 22, or it may be dead and useless, James 2 and verse 20. Our faith may be little, Matthew 6, 30, or it may be great, Luke 7 and 9. Noah was one who had a great faith. He had a faith that was active and living in his service to God. Noah had been warned of things not yet seen. And yet he believed what God told him. That's the basic idea of faith is we can trust in God. Now the Bible says he was warned of God of things not yet seen. Noah had never seen a flood, and yet God's telling him, I'm going to bring a flood to destroy the entire world. And it may be he's never even seen it rain. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, chapter 2, at verses 5 and 6, For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So Noah had never seen a flood, and it may be even at that time that he lived, he had never seen it rain. No one had, perhaps. And yet, he believed God when God told him he was going to bring a flood, that it would rain for 40 days and nights. It showed the confidence that he had in God. And he could have that confidence in God because God's a being that cannot lie. The Bible tells us at least twice in the Bible, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, and in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18, that God cannot lie. In fact, the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. That's why we can trust him. Whatever God tells us we can know is the truth, and we can follow it and know we'll be doing what's right because God cannot lie. Noah understood that. And so when God commanded Noah about these things that he had never seen before, he believed what God told him. And he trusted God to do what God wanted him to do. And so the Bible says that he was moved with godly fear. When we think about fear, and I believe that fear is so important, I think fear can be a great motivator in getting people to do what God wants them to do. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And there are a lot of men who have been persuaded to become obedient to God because of their fear for God. But most of the time when the Bible talks about fear, it uses the word phobos, from which we get our word phobia. And it has to do with this idea of terror. But the word that's used here to talk about the fear that Noah had is a different word. It's the Greek word, eulambia, which means caution, then reverence, then godly fear. It's this idea of fearful of doing anything that's going to disappoint God. Several years ago, Brother Batchel Barrett Baxter, who's now passed on, but he had taught for many years at David Lipscomb College, and he told about a young man there at school who had gone out with some of his friends on one occasion. They were going out to uh, just be out by themselves and to uh, cook out and so forth. And when they stopped to get the food and supplies, one of the young men had bought a six-pack of beer. And, and when he got out there, he opened up a beer for everybody and handed this young man one and he just couldn't bring himself to drink it. Now, he asked his friends if they might just take him back to the dorm. 
And, and he explained later the reason he did it was, he says, the whole time I was there looking at that beer, all I could think of in my mind was my godly father and mother sitting on a couch back at home praying for me. And I knew how disappointed, how hurt they would be if they learned that their son had been drinking beer. And he says, my fear of hurting my parents kept me from doing it. That is a godly fear. That's the kind of fear I believe that Noah had here in this respect. Because of that godly fear that he was moved by, the Bible says he prepared an ark to the saving of his house. That's our third point here. He prepared an ark. This shows the faith that he had in action. His faith was not based upon sight because it was pointed out in Monday's lesson or Sunday night's lesson. We walk by faith, not by sight. Noah walked by faith, not by sight. But also, the text says, moved with godly fear, he prepared an ark. His faith was not just faith by itself. He believed that God could save him. He was convinced that God could save him. But he didn't just ask God for salvation. His faith led him to obey God and to do what God had told him that he needed to do. Here we see Noah's ark, has his faith in action in building that ark. Now, Jalen talked to us about Joseph, and he talked about the faith that Joseph had throughout that whole time that he's in Egypt, about the number of years that he had been faithful to God, trusting in God. Well, look at Noah. Noah's faith in God of something he's never seen before lasted 120 years just in building that ark. He had a faith that continued to keep him and to guide him in his life of service to God. And so he believed that God would save him. And so he did what God told him to do in building this ark. Now, just stop and think about that a minute. Do you suppose that maybe any of the other people there might have been tempted at some point to build boats themselves, especially maybe when they see it begin to rain and see the water begin to rise? I don't know if they did or not, but I know if they did, they did not succeed in saving themselves or their families because that was not God's plan. God had a plan for salvation, and that meant building an ark. He did not command the building of a fleet of arks. He commanded building an ark. In the same way today, if anyone is going to be saved, it's going to be saved in the church, the ark being a type of church. And if anyone's going to be saved, it's going to be in the church. God never commanded man to build 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 churches. Jesus said, I will build my church, one church. If those people back in Noah's day built boats, those boats were destroyed. And if men today want to build churches other than the church that Christ himself has built, they're not going to last. Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 13, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. It's not going to last. It can't succeed because that's not God's plan today for saving people. His plan back in Noah's day was that salvation would be in that ark. Today, those who are saved are going to be in God's church today. And so Noah, because of the faith that he had in God, acted to do exactly what God told him to do, and he began to build that ark. God told him to build that ark out of gopher wood. I have no idea what kind of wood that is. I can't point anywhere and say, now there's a gopher tree. I have no idea what, what tree. But Noah knew, and Noah built the ark out of gopher wood. God told him to build it 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. And I know, I understand that there are a variety of different cubits that men have had throughout history. And that there were cubits back then, normally considered to be the measurement from the elbow to the tip of the finger, about 18 inches. But there were other cubits that went as long as 24 inches. I don't know what cubit he used to measure by. But Noah knew what God meant. And Noah built that ark 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. God told him you're to pitch that ark inside and out with pitch. That's to make it watertight so it will float. It's not going to sink with you and those animals. And that's exactly what Noah did. He pitched it inside and out with pitch. And then God told him, you put a door in the ark. Just one. And that's what he did. There was only one way into that ark. There's only one way into God's ark today, the church. And that's through Christ. There's only one door. Jesus said, I am the door. And so there's only way into the church, just as there was only one way into that ark that God had nowhere to build. 
And there was only one window because that's what God told Noah to do. And Noah did that. Noah heard the commands of God and he obeyed the commands of God and built that ark. Today, if we want to walk by faith as Noah did, and if we want to be saved as Noah was saved by God, then like Noah, we're going to have to hear the commands of God and we're going to have to obey them. That means we're going to have to listen to what God says about salvation. And listening to what God says about salvation means we're going to have to have that kind of faith in God that Noah had. We're going to have to believe in God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and He's a reward of them that diligently seek Him. But it's not only faith in God, it's faith in Christ we've got to have. John 8, 24. Jesus said, except you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. But believing in Christ, then we've got to repent of our sins. We've got to make a change in how we're living. And we've got to do what God wants us to do. And so in repenting, we change from the way we've been going and the way we've been living and start living the way God wants us to live. And repenting we then leads us to make our confession in Christ. There were those in the first century who believed in Jesus, but John chapter 12 and verse 42 tells us they would not confess Him lest they be put out of the synagogue. We've got to be willing to confess Christ, to confess before men that He is the Son of God. And then we've got to be willing to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So that's what Noah has done in his life. He's heard God's word and he's obeyed God's word and being saved. But the whole time that he's busy building the ark, Noah was also busy doing something else. He was busy preaching to the people of his day. 2 Peter 2 and verse 5, when Peter talks about the destruction of this world by flood. He says of God, God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. To preach righteousness simply means to preach the commands of God. Psalms 119, verse 172, all thy commandments are righteousness. So when Noah was a preacher of righteousness, he was a man preaching the commands of God. Now I found this interesting. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian that lived during the first century, he had been a general in the Jewish army captured by the Romans and, and later wrote a history about the destruction of Jerusalem. But he also in his work of antiquities wrote about the history of the Jewish people. And he had this to say about Noah. He said, Noah being grieved at the things which were done by them and being displeased at their counsels, urged them to change for the better their thoughts and their actions. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And according to Josephus, he was talking to those people, trying to encourage them to change the way they were thinking. Their thoughts were only of evil continually. And to change their actions, the way they live, to get them doing what God wanted to do. Or if we want to be a man of faith like Noah, we need to be those who are preaching the commands of God. We need to be teaching people what God wants us to do. And then finally, and I only have about two or three minutes according to what they told me, uh, by his faith, Noah condemned that ancient world. Noah did through his faith and his building the ark bring condemnation upon them. And by that, all we mean is he condemned the world by showing them that they have no excuse. They could have been saved if they, like Noah, had trusted in God, had that faith, and were obedient to God to do what God wanted them to do. But when they fail to do that, they have no excuse. Because God can always point out to Noah and say, here's a man who did listen and who did obey, and who would say, you could have done the same thing. You have no excuse for not doing it. When our Lord walked this earth, He condemned the Jews of His generation because of this very thing, that they would not listen and obey. And He told them in Matthew 12 and verse 41, that the men of Nineveh, will rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Why? Because that generation, those of Nineveh, they repented when they heard the preaching of Jonah. Here is a nation of people that were idol worshipers. And one day this man comes in from Israel, a Jew, who's preaching to them and saying to them, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. And they repented. From the king on the throne to the lowest slave. They all repented to do what God said. And so God spared them. They were saved. 
And yet Jesus says here in this generation, that is the generation of Jews at the time that Jesus lived, Jesus said, you've heard someone greater than Jonas. You've heard the very Son of God, but you haven't changed. You haven't obeyed. You have no excuse. In the day of judgment, you can't say to God, I didn't know. It, it, it wasn't made plain to me what I needed to do. Listen, the people in Nineveh understood, and all they had to preach to them was this Jonah, a prophet of God. You've had God's own son. What excuse can you offer before God? We may show the world by our obedience that we can obey God and we can be saved and doing that we're condemning the world because we're taking away any excuse they might have for not obeying God by our obedience we will either condemn the world or by our disobedience we will be condemned with the world we have to make the decision what we're going to do but now here's the question that we end our lesson with and that is how have we reacted to God's warnings he's given to us Noah was moved by godly fear at the warnings of God's judgment coming upon them. God has told us plainly that this world in which we're living is going to be destroyed by fire and all the works in it are going to be burned up. How have we reacted to that? Have we reacted like Noah with faith to believe what God says and then to do what God tells us to do? Or have we been like those of Noah's day who heard and rejected and failed to do it? How we react to the warnings that God's given to us will determine whether or not we will live with God eternally in hell or, be, or in heaven or be lost eternally in hell. And it's our decision to make. And it's the hope and prayer of all of those who are children of God that all of us would have the kind of faith that Noah had to respond in obedience to his will and have the kind of faith that will last 120 years or until we die. Thank you very much. We're going to have a, a prayer now. Brother Ron Cobb will lead us in that prayer.